Thanks so much for checking out the Coin Stories podcast video page. I'm Natalie Brunel, and I'm talking to the leading voices in Bitcoin about their backstories, career paths, and their philosophy on BTC. This podcast does not provide financial advice. I'm super excited to share my guest today is leading Bitcoin analyst, Willie Wu. Willie is an industry pioneer of on-chain metrics, and he extracts investment signals and price forecasts based on blockchain data. He has a very popular market newsletter you can subscribe to, and he'll share in this interview why he feels we're in the last cycle for Bitcoin. What does that mean? Here's Willie Wu. All right, Willie, thank you so much for joining me. I'm super excited to chat with you. And I want to start at the very beginning. Where are you from? I read New Zealand. Yeah, I'm a Kiwi. Um, actually, I was born in Hong Kong, um, but, you know, went to New Zealand as a toddler. I'm, I'm currently based in Hong Kong. Um, but yeah, most of my life has been in New Zealand, apart from decent stints overseas. So, yeah. Tell me a little bit about your upbringing. Like, what did your family do? Do you have siblings? Yeah, I have, um, I have a sister. Um, you know, I come from a very small town of 100,000 people on, in, in New Zealand. It's called Napier. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we, we were like, a, I, I would say lower class, working class um, family. Um, what else do you say? Um, um I mean, I mean, I, I'm, you know, because I was not born in New Zealand. I, it was, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a, a kind of an immigration story um, coming in, and like um, I don't know what to say really. It's like um, I yeah, just went through, um, just went through school, <laughs> university. Um, yeah, maybe. If you ask any questions regarding that, I'm happy to do so. But um... well, what's the immigration story? Can you share that? Sorry. Sorry. Well, what's the immigration story? Can you share that? Yeah. Okay. So, um, like my um, like my my uncle, my dad's um, brother, ended up uh, marrying a a Kiwi. Um, he was he was I think he was serving on merchant. Um, like ships and um, ended up stopping and um, falling in love and and that led to um, our immigration like my dad um, decided there would be more opportunity in New Zealand um, and took that opportunity when his brother little brother invited him over um, because he had a business at that point and um, so we we took that that opportunity and I I think um, I think there were probably it was like one of the earlier kind of um, opportunities people would take to leave Hong Kong because um, we all knew that it would um, hand over to China and back then um, you know it was a heavily communist regime with um, with not a lot of freedom so that was a big fear so um, you know there's waves of immig immigration out of Hong Kong. Um, and we were probably a decade early. <laughs> um, and yeah, so we, we landed in, in New Zealand and um, it's, it's interesting because like my parents did not speak English. Um, so they had to figure out English. Um, and I, I found it pretty easy. I, I remember like, um, it's like, it just made sense because when you're, you're in, you know, a three-year-old or a four-year-old, it just, it just comes naturally. Um, it, it does create a generational gap, or well, no, a cultural gap, uh, generation and cultural gap. Um, your parents don't seem very cool because <laughs> they don't quite fit in the culture. Um, so it does lead to, or for me, it led to being feeling quite different. Um, like, um, didn't really quite feel like I was accepted. Um, and um, yeah, like I think from that, I would say I, I was also an introvert. So I just um, retreated into um, my thing, which was um, like programming computers um, when I was a, like, I guess, 11, 10, 11, and got pretty good at it um, for a time. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I think, uh, well, I probably would have turned out that way anyway, but yeah. Um, yeah, like I, I, I think um, you know, you know, I spent most of my life up to my 
uh, mid, mid to late 20s in New Zealand. And then New Zealand's got this particular culture where um, it's almost a coming of age um, tradition where you just buy a ticket and you fly overseas and you live abroad. Um, and I did that in my 20s. And um, I think it was the first time I felt really free. Um, and I don't know, it was uh, it's probably one of the big um, developmental um, chapters of my life. Um, like, you know, you, what the interesting thing about when you like leave, well, you're going to quit your career and your job for a while, you put it on hold um, and you're just out there, right? And you're just living in different um, situations, different cities, meeting new people, get a lot of time to think, um, you know, particularly if you're an introvert like me, <laughs> I, I had a lot of time thinking about different things and what I wanted to do. And so um, I guess I came back and I was like, I know exactly what I wanted to do. In fact, I, I came back early because I figured out what I wanted to do, which was um, to go headlong into like the tech world and, and build a business around that. Um, and so that kind of started like this major uh, part of my life, which was um, like um, building a tech startup. Um, and this is in the you know, early 2000s, and um, the roadmap wasn't that clear back then, you know, people were trying to figure out what is this kind of thing you do with startups, you know, the 1990s with dot-com bubble, like people were trying to figure it out, and it's not like today where these accelerators and a blog article that explains everything, um, and so and I really like that, um, I just naturally found I was good at, um, you know, trying figuring things out in creative ways which um no one had really solved before yeah. um and you know I was young too so I was kind of had this mindset of well if other people have done it already it's probably the not the best way to do it and I had kind of had this disdain for the way everything was done um so I don't know it, be, it became um you know it, it felt really native to uh, my my personality a little bit of rebel um, a little bit of um, thinking about things differently and so you know Willie um, it's so interesting what you said because my family immigrated to the U.S. from Poland and I was five years old so I relate to you a lot because I kind of assimilated very quickly in the sense that I picked up the language but I felt just like you I just I, I didn't want to be considered different I just wanted to be considered American so um, like I remember I even changed my name like I my birth name is Natalia but that was too foreign so I changed it to Natalie because that was the American version and it's just so funny how when you're young you know you just want to fit in wherever you are um, and I was kind of curious with you did your sort of did you think about money when you were young did you have this concept of like I I want to make money someday or I want to do better than my parents because I know also especially in Asian cultures, it seems like the parents are a little bit more strict sometimes and they want their kids to go into a certain type of field or pr profession because that's essentially what will, you know, give them a sustainable income. Was that the case with you? Yeah, this is a really good one because in Chinese culture, there's huge pressure for um, the kids to do well. Um, in fact, um, I believe in Hong Kong, I'm probably not less so now, but definitely, you know, in the past, there's like suicide season and that's usually around exam times. Um, and like there's huge pressure on these kids. And I felt that, certainly felt that. Um, and so, I mean, I, 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 I was like, um, you know, Kiwis are pretty laid back, eh? Um, <laughs> and the schooling system is actually quite innovative. It is very much centered around play. Um, particularly in primary school and I went in there like a Chinese kid going oh I could do well blah, blah, blah. and it was very stressful um, and then interestingly my parents had this um, kind of um, conflict where they were like pushing us as kids to succeed mm -hmm. um, like um, pushing us to succeed at the same time saying money's not everything um, 
money is not everything. Um, there's much more important things in the world than money, you know. So we've got these, these kind of mixed signals like, you know, friendship and all these sort of things are really much more important than money, um, you know, like, and like if you were to draw a list of one to 10, I think money would have been 10 on out of, you know, this list of things that were more important. Um, yet we're being pushed to succeed, to be financially successful for money. <laughs> and, um, and I kind of like, you know, I think I was always a little bit rebellious. And I think maybe that comes from, I don't know, with you, Natalie, but like, I, I think that comes from being in a society where you're not fully accepted. Um, and I think, I don't know, um, you know, I have friends that, that are like in similar situations where they move to another society where they, they're kind of not accepted. And that kind of rebels as well internally. You know, they're not like um, like um, dissidents or anything, but the, there's a rebellious nature. And um, like I kind of, I kind of like the idea of just not being having I, I grew up like not wanting not respecting money I kind of thought like I just want to be an interesting person I want to live an interesting life and I don't want to be have wow. the trappings of these rich fellas you know yeah and um until I was like I think I went to university bought my first car and realized things cost money <laughs> <laughs> and I was like oh actually I kind of need money and that ended up evolving into realizing that um you know i decided money was um freedom like i was like and actually everything i was taught by my parents about money was wrong and that um money is an enabler and then so i was like yeah well that's what i want to do um like um there was a particular time in my life after university where I was working for a corporate as an engineer and every day was the same and <laughs> two years would go by and it would it'd feel like months, right? And I was like, and I didn't know really what I wanted to do. And this was before I traveled overseas. Um, and I was like, wow, gee, you know, if I don't have anything better to do, what I will do is pursue money until I figure out what I wanted to do. And then I started to read about um, wealth and, you know, rich dad, poor dad, you know, the classics. Yeah. And, and sort of did my own schooling and like, and, you know, like one of the things was like my, my mom died of cancer and she died on a waiting list uh, to be operated on with the public health service, which back then was um, not very efficient um, for urgent cases. And- Oh, wow, I'm like, so sorry. Yeah, well, the, the, the thing is, like, uh, my uncle said, why didn't we know, this is my uncle in Hong Kong, why didn't we know about this? Because we could have paid for private health. And I was like, you know, I was thinking, you know, it's true. It's like, if you've got money, then screw the system um, that can't serve you. You just pay your way and jump to the front. And that is a choice, right? You've now, if you've got money, you've now got the choice and that. And so that, again, that was like, um, freedom of choice means um, it is equated to having um, resources and money. So that, that was a big change. Um, but still, you know, I think I, I like my value system was, yeah, money is a really good amplifier and tool. Um, but also I still valued, um, what would you say? Um, I think really valued um, purpose and, you know, waking up in the morning and being super excited about what you're doing and, and not wasting time. Because I saw a lot of people trading time for money. Like I, the, the experience I had working for a corporate, I just traded years of my life for a, a few bucks in the bank account, which is, was a very bad trade. Yeah. Um, and so like the trade that I liked to do was to live life as much as I can whilst making money and amplifying freedom and then having that, you know, circle and spiral to um, and leverage against each other. So that was that was the um, <clears throat> and I think that that really happened when I started traveling and I think um, 
really it's just about um, doing the things you're scared of, um, which is really in a way um, like swallowing risk. Um, and interestingly, the richest people in the world um, have this combination of smarts, um, passion, but um, they're risk takers. And without the risk, there's really no reward. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of how I view uh, money, work, um, life in a way. Um, do the things that are risky, that excite you, um, and and try to conserve your time. You know. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah. Well, so when you were younger and you got into programming, I'm assuming that you were interested in computers and you found that to be fun because you were an introvert, like you mentioned. So how did that really start? How did you learn about computers? And is that what you decided you wanted to do when you grew up? Yeah, that's a really good question. Like, why did I pick computers? Um, uh, you know, like when I was like, that age 10 we had a boarder um, in our house you know someone that would pay rent and board and live with us and he was a foreign foreign student that just finished his university working as an engineer and um and like um oh i should say my dad passed when i was really young um no no actually roughly around that time a few years earlier and so it was like, I kind of stuck to him because he was like a male um, role model in a way. And oh, wow. I could ask him all these things, you know, because, you know, I was, I'd think about things and I'd ask him and he'd have answers that were like, that's solid. That's a solid answer. It's a solid technical answer to what I'm asking. And I remember going, what's computer programming? And he said, look, it's like this. And he wrote on a piece of paper. Um, a program it was a simple program that would loop around and add a number and print it out and I was like oh so that's how it works and I was like this is really cool and then he took me to work his work on a weekend and back then it was like um, pretty clunky computers and I remember playing um, this text-based game um, called Star Trek um, and it was really it was a different time you know it's like it's not like computers these days not like these smartphones it was like you've got this big it almost feels like mechanical thing it's like this big huge computer the size of a desk and it's whirring away and these these discs that you pop in to load things and it had this sort of electromechanical feel it was like a um, steampunky yeah. and you had this glowing monochrome screen and you run this program and um, it was like, it really captured me. It was like something very <laughs> cypherpunky. And like, then I said, how does this work? And he printed out this, like, I think it was four page printout and it was computer code. And I was like, wow. And I'd take it to school, walking to school, I'd read this computer code trying to figure it out. And so it kind of built my passion. And so um, I eventually um, got, my parents to buy me, a, well, my mum to buy me a computer. And um, I just went straight in because it was so cool, you know. Um, and I think it, you know, there's something about doing something that very few people um, do um, that makes it undiscovered and cool. And so, um, I, and I think I've always really enjoyed um, being in that kind of space where it's not really well, um, it's not very common, you know things that aren't very common that's sort of early um and there's a lot of um like ultimately you know there's a lot of things you can sort of figure out on your own mm -hmm. it's much like the startups really um like today i wouldn't want to do a startup because that path is now <laughs> much more um it's almost formula yeah, it's, it's like a formula it's like a formula these days um so yeah well, tell me a little bit about that. How did you transition from university where you studied engineering, right, to the startup and, and what that was like? Okay, so I, um, you know, when I traveled, um, you know, if you're a Kiwi, you probably go to UK, you get a job there, you hang out with your mates. I ended up going to Canada on a working holiday visa. Um, and, um, you know, on that day, those days, people would go and grab Hotmail in a cyber cafe. And I was like, oh, let me try something new. And I thought I'll get one of these handheld computers, um, which was a new thing. And they called them digital organizers at the time. And the idea was to plug this thing in 
um, to your computer and synchronize it. And then it would synchronize for email and all this stuff. And But you could get this thing that would snap on to it, which was a modem, and that would connect to a phone line. And that phone line would dial up like a fax machine, you know, <laughs> and um, pull in um, internet. And it was really clunky. And of course, it was very much like my, um, you know, 10 and 12 year old um, days playing on these clunky machines. It was, they were monochrome as well. And they ran on double A batter, triple A batteries. <laughs> it was like, cool. It was like taking me back to my um, childhood <laughs> roots. Um, and so I got really into it. Um, I was, as I was traveling, while people were writing email on at cyber cafes, I was, you know, on a bus in a queue, whatever, I would take out um, my stylus and write to my friends and clear my email. And it was a really engaging experience. Um, and I, it was kind of this, it was really early, you know, if you were to look at me in a Starbucks in Canada, I was sitting there with my head on a screen while everyone was just talking to each other. Um, and like, that's the, the reality of everywhere now. Everyone's walking around with the heads on the screen and their screen on their mobiles. And that was really the early mobile phase. And I was like, man, this thing is going to take off because um, the experience is really compelling. Um, and I pretty much had that mobile um, computing device with me for years without ever having a day not using it, um, even though it was so clunky, which was an appeal to me. And so we ended up, um, we, as in I went back to New Zealand, contacted my um, one of my good friends who was the best coder I knew and said, we've got to build a company in this space because this whole thing's going to take off. And so... Um, like, um, and it didn't work like that, right? Because he ended up working for a bank on the internet banking for a job and um, completely crazy. He tells me some stories of how bad that stuff is. And um, I ended up like doing contracts to all these startups building um, mobile software for this new, you know, back then it was Palm OS, Palm Pilots. And so um, I ended up learning how to build websites and designing um, GUIs for these mobile apps. And I started contracting for two years. And, um, and this is like, um, they're all US companies. And um, I was in New Zealand. Um, and I was like, it was quite cool. You know, I was like waking up at 10 a.m. I go to the gym, have a really nice kind of ease into the day, clear some email, but then I just get into work at 10 p.m. through to 2 a.m., which was a nice window of time with the U.S. guys, and like it was really interesting because I was remote working um, in the late 90s on a dial-up line um, before broadband, and just knowing the team members and and working quite fluidly. And I was like, well, how long? I'm just going to travel. <laughs> so I started traveling around the world um, on a dial-up connection to, to earn my contract money, which was, um, you know, it, for me back in that, those times, it was a lot of money. Um, you know, I could make my um, salary in two, one or two months of contracting. Wow. Um, wow. because first the US dollar was strong and two, that was very few people had those skills. And, and so, you know, I loved it. It was one of the best times of my life. I was just backpacking around the world. I thought I was making crazy money for, the, for, for what I was used to. And, um, and also like feeling like the stuff I was building was like, um, like being used by these new startups rising in the mobile field. And, eventually I bumped into my friend again I was you know I was traveling around the world I bunched, bumped into my friend who was the best coder I knew and he was now doing the key, great Kiwi tradition of the big OE and his overseas experience and um, bumped into him in Montreal and you know I was trying to figure out how to learn you know trying to learn French because like the next thing was to go to France to cycle tour with some some friends of mine and like I just bumped into him there and, and he said oh, let's do that um, idea you had because I'm really sick of this working for these, you know, these corporates. <laughs> um, and so I was like, okay, 
Well, there's one application we need to build because the company that did it right um, got acquired and no one else is doing that app anymore. And they just, no one's done anything in that. So we ended up. What's um, the app? Uh, yeah, well, we built this app called Snapamail and um, it was in the early email on mobile for this platform because um, everyone was mobile email back back then you know the little blackberries were just starting to come out um, and um, and they were like 30 40 dollars a month subscription and we were like actually what you can do is build an email app and put it on these this palm pilot but they were starting to turn into phones and actually do away with all the like middleware where you pay them 34 dollars a month because we think that the internet speed on these things are going to go really fast and these devices are going to be very powerful and we can process email on a real server connected as if it was a pc and cut out that middleman which is charging you 40 bucks a month mm -hmm. and so we did that and we built this pretty neat app actually it was like we kind of shoehorned this desktop power app into this crazy little um what was really designed as a digital organizer and um you know my buddy had to rewrite parts of the operating system that the operating system should have done for us but he had to do it in order to get the stuff we needed done you know like the demo was like by the way you're used to an email that's like you know blackberry it's tiny and there's for this email, um, the next message is an ebook. And this is like, you know, like Romeo and Juliet, you can read the entire book in this message, which was unheard of in these little devices. And um, that that app became um, like the most popular app. Um, it was like one of the top sellers in that industry. And we, we won um, probably the majority, I don't know the exact numbers, the majority of the uh, market share in that that classification um, <clears throat> even got Walt Mossberg to, you know, of the Wall Street Journey, Journal at the time to give us a glowing review. Wow! And so it was kind of cool. We it it was a maybe a three to four year journey. Um, well, it was during the startup that you heard about Bitcoin, right? So how did that happen? Yeah, well, um, you know, like years down the, down the road. Um, I was doing another startup. We won't bother going into that, but one of the, the lead developers said that um, Bitcoin broke a thousand dollars, and um, and I was like, "What's Bitcoin?" And he explained it, and I was like, "Okay, that's like digital gold." And um, and this is post. Um, I mean, this this was tail end of twenty thirteen, on the end of that bubble, um, and um, if I recall, yeah. That, so there was it was just exploded in this bubble but like it's post 2008 right in 2008 we had the world financial crisis and before that i had exited my startups and i had a little bit of money and i was starting to learn how to invest that and and trade that and and one of the things that we did like some of us that we did um you know, my, my friends that were kind of mentoring me how to how to you know work with financial markets we're saying you know gold is the thing because this whole thing's going to collapse which it did you know the financial markets did collapse um and so i knew a little bit about gold um and then i realized that now you could replicate this thing on um the internet natively you know it was like well shit you know this thing um just got invented a few years ago and it's early and you can look at it and it's just bleeding edge you can cut yourself on it you can it's hard to use and i figured you know mp3s was like that um you know 12 years ago and now the ipod's out and i give this 12 years to get to mainstream and i was like i just ran the ratio of what bitcoin was valued at versus gold and i was like if we give this 12 years to get to gold that's four hundred fifty thousand dollars bitcoin and Right now, the price has just crashed from $1,000 to $600. And I was like, okay, I'm going to start buying this and I'll buy one Bitcoin just for fun in case it goes to 450 I won't be pissed. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, you know, I later on traveled to Bali and there was a really yeah. good Bitcoin meetup there and um, met some really interesting people. 
and they started to tell me the the lowdown on bitcoin and how it really works and all the details around it and i was like no this is really interesting so as the price was sliding down in 2014 and the longest bear market we had um i was just continually buying um, as it came down what was it about what they said in bali and in the community there that really convinced you and had you going further down the rabbit hole and gaining more conviction uh, really, I think, I mean, oh, gee, it's like, I mean, it's all sort of merged in one now. So what did I learn? I learned that, um, you know, I got a high resolution to, you know, I just had this amorphous thinking that it was um, digital gold on the internet. I didn't figure out what exactly um, that meant and how it worked. And um, so it took me um, some time to, actually it was like maybe four or five months after investing so this is like opposite to most people i invested first um and then i did deeper research me too um, and read really this is, this is yeah. like yeah i just put some money in and yeah, um, not much but then when i did more and more research i read the white paper understood prefer work by then um, you know, I just got more into it. I started to feel the community around it. And then it takes you down that rabbit hole of hard money. And then you frame this thing. Like, I think one of the key unlocks is reframing um, Bitcoin is this um, currency that's um, a new kind of thing on the internet. And reframing that um, slightly differently is... Um, we've figured out for the very first time how to put money um, natively and programmatically as part of the um, substrate of the internet. Mm -hmm. And because by then you can see that, you know, software is in the world, everything's going digital, and basically every part of society is being eaten by the internet. And I was like, actually, you've got this money um, that is actually now woven into the fabric of the internet. And that seemed like a really powerful idea. Um, and just the way it worked, you couldn't bring it down. You know, you can, like the internet, you can nuke the entire world and it would still run. Um, and Bitcoin's the same thing. You can nuke it as hard as you can, but it'll keep running. Um, so, like, it just, like, it's powerful in what it can produce, um, how big it can get, which is the entire world economy. You, you can't take this thing down. Um, yeah, it was, it was an interesting, it was an interesting um, viewpoint, right? And so, like, I was a believer that, you know, I'm not bearish to the internet. I don't think that we're going to give up the internet and go back to um, faxes and telephone lines um, so why would I think that um, would like this thing would be a flash in the pan and um, you know print, paper printed money um, by some central government would be um, what my grandchildren would be using you know while we're in this far off future you know so it's really hard to it's really hard to think um, it's really hard to think that paper money would be the thing that would win this if you're a technologist and understand where things are going. And so, um, you know, it's just like lots of stuff like listening to Andreas Antonopoulos. He's a, he, he was a great um, explainer of how this thing worked. And, and so, you know, a lot of information being shared. So how did you start to get into uh, on-chain metrics and data? What, what led you to creating Woobull, you know, this data resource for people that has indicators that you created yourself, right? In-house indicators. What does that even mean? Yeah, um, it's, I think this is because, you know, super introvert. I'm like, mm, like I, I, uh, I did something that was not my norm, which was like, um, the leader of the Bitcoin meetup in Bali, Gary's his name. Gary said, Is it, uh, I need some help running this. And, you know, he ran this meetup every week. 
um, and it was it was really popular. Um, but it was and it was really done well. It was like a show, right? It was eventually it was videoed and it was regular like a regular thing on YouTube, um, and so it was quite engaging. And he said, "I need some people to give me a hand." And um, so does anyone want to share the load and take a slot in the meetup? And, um, you know, I was pretty passionate about this by then. And I said, yeah, well, I'll, do, I'll do a 10-minute slot. And put my hand up. And I, I figured I'd do this thing called the number of the week, which basically would grab a number from anything in the industry of Bitcoin and, and you know, do a dive into it. And... Um, and at the time, um, we had the site called blockchain.io and they put all these charts of the, the network up. And I'd oft find myself often going to this, this um, site, looking at different charts to try and find some content to, for the next meetup. And, um, you know, you stare at charts long enough, you start to go, well, this is really interesting. Um, and uh, I, I remember like the amount of volume going through the network seemed to track the, the market cap of the, um, the network. And I didn't know why, but um, you know, I, I, I ran a ratio between the two and um, it, it created this sort of pattern. And, um, and someone asked, Someone asked on Twitter at the time, what is the closest thing to a price earnings ratio for Bitcoin? It's not a company, it has no earnings. It doesn't have a share price. It has a token price, but there's no earnings. And I thought about it and I was like, um, I think it's this ratio. And I said, that's this. And I didn't call it, um, you know, it was eventually called MDT ratio, but like, um, and the concept was, the uh, the the amount of activity in this network, which is it's an investment network. Um, so whenever people invest, you see volume moving between investors, and so you run the ratio of activity in the network to how it's valued. And I know that they track each other, and so um, that was my first um, thing. And then one thing led to the next, and the next. So. Um, that, that's how it started. I think it was quite organic, um, just out of curiosity. Um, and then I remember, um, I think one of the key moments was um, in Cayman Islands. No, not Cayman, Canary Islands. Canary Islands. And I was spending a month there. And like, it was just, my, it was kind of my bachelor time. Or my girlfriend at the time had moved to the US to be with her folks for a month and I had this one month to myself where I just surfed and had could geek out on the computer and I, I actually had reserved that year just to do work on creative projects and I was just looking at um, going well there's this whole crypto space I've got bitcoins I bought the ethereum ICO and I saw how coins can go up and people were all actively trading these these altcoins and I was like I want to run um, you know simulations of um, things like if I bought a basket of low cap um, coins um, would it outperform Bitcoin because in, in the stock markets you know under portfolio theory which I read about if you buy like low cap stocks high risk um, also high return but if you buy a basket of them you can lower your risk and still get um, the same return so that that's actually a better um, portfolio and I wanted to figure out if it was true for crypto so I spent one month writing a whole bunch of code getting all the data and running these simulations and um, and it, it was surprising that um, that didn't actually play out like Bitcoin wow. outperformed most of them um, most the baskets so I tweeted that and I had like I think I had 200 followers at the time and that just took off. Um, <laughs> and I remember like Barry Silbert, who was like kind of, I don't know, he, at the time was a bit of like the godfather of crypto. He was, he owned all the companies. I remember him asking me questions about it. Coindesk said, can we republish this, this article blog post you did? Um, so it just really took off and my Twitter started exploding. 
um, CoinDesk kept publishing um, the stuff that I was doing. And um, then they asked me to write for them. And then Forbes asked me, like Laura Shin approached me to write for Forbes. Um, and so eventually it was like, I was this um, writer, content creator, researcher. Um, and that's really all how it started. Um, wow. I was just doing this thing out of curiosity, but um, I guess people liked um, the content and it started to take off. It's so fascinating talking about that sort of basket because I just tweeted last week that I was talking to someone who doesn't have Bitcoin, they're an altcoiner, and I go, why don't you have Bitcoin? And he goes, well, even if it goes to 100,000, that's like a two times return for me and I get 8,000 times on altcoins. So why would I put my money into Bitcoin? And I've even met other people just out and about. If we talk about crypto, you know, I'll ask, do you have Bitcoin? They go, no, it's too expensive. It's out of reach. But I do have Doge or I have some of these other coins because if they take off, I could potentially make a ton of money. What do you what do you think about that? Because, you know, obviously it seems like pe the general public who doesn't understand Bitcoin thinks that there's a huge hurdle to getting into it because of the price of just one. Yeah, I think uh, my views have changed a lot through the years. Uh, much, um, I think it's valid that these the, my thoughts have changed through the years too, because um, the ecosystem's changed. Um, like, there's some validity to what they're saying, um, but there's also some things that are not valid. And like, um, it is true, Bitcoin is now probably within its last 100 X. Um, possibly last 10x, um, 10x to 100x. Um, and we've had like something like tens of thousand x to get to this point. And so like I now think of Bitcoin as money, um, as hard money. Um, if you were talking in the crypto sense, um, it's the equivalent of the US dollar um, without the fiat crap. But it's, it's where you will pack um, your store of value it's where you will, uh, um, you know, sit and forget and um, go get on with your life. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to uh, try buying these altcoins, which and try and get the eight thousand x, um, yeah, that's uh, that's possible. Um, but that's a profession. It's it's called trading, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it is a it is a full on amount of time to where you're going to make money or lose money. Um, and whether you're good at it or not will determine whether you can get 8,000x or you lose all your money. 90% um, of traders lose their money. Um, only 10% win in, in leverage trading. I think um, often what happens, and like a lot of these guys may not have actually traded through multiple cycles, it's great. You know, you will get, um, you know, we did a survey of my friends in 2017. I think the average average return from the start to the end was um, 170 X and Bitcoin did, if you caught the bottom and sold the exact top, it was um, 100 X, right? Wow. Um, and some of them did 100 X overnight on some of the stuff. But I tell you, everyone lost their shirts once that bear market hit, right? And they were trapped in these coins when the liquidity dried out, they couldn't sell these positions, um, all sorts of scamming happened. Um, so it was a full-time job. Um, and good luck to you to to um, to try that, which it's it's great. You'll learn lots. Um, in terms of investing, um, you can do that too. Um, but I found that if you're going to invest, then it's really a venture capital game. You're going to have to do a lot of research. Uh, maybe you need to learn how to read code, or have maybe a team of people. Some people are going to comb the GitHub and see if their code base is written well. Um, you're gonna comb their community. You're gonna look at all these things. It actually takes a lot of time, like a venture capitalist to go, this is a token supported by a team. We're building something real and they're backed by people and it's listed and it's like all these check marks. Um, and it's like venture, it's another vocation, right? It's not like Bitcoin where you just park it and forget it. Um, so there's validity, but these are vocations. These are these are actually jobs. Um, and if you were just going to buy Dogecoin um, because it's going to go up and it's the meme um, meme coin, well, you're just gambling. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, casino. Um, unless you've done the research. And so the, the thing's valid. You you can you can get your eight thousand X if you're like, um, you're like the shitcoin Jesus. You know, um, some people can be like maybe um, one in a hundred. <laughs> But most people will make money because everyone's a genius in a bull run till they're not a genius anymore. Um, so it's it's kind of valid. Um, so like, but it's mixed. Yeah. I want to talk to you a little bit more about your on-chain metrics. And I want to be conscientious of the people, the viewers or the listeners out there that really don't understand what that even means. So can you kind of describe what it, what that analysis analysis looks like how do you do on-chain metrics and what are you seeing right now yeah okay so um if you break down markets um, markets um, happen um, on exchanges where people um, buy and sell um, and there's two types of exchanges ones um, for speculators which um, trade on leverage they usually trade these things called futures markets they don't actually buy and sell the underlying asset they just trade paper contracts, betting on the price going up and down, right? That's one kind of trader. And then you've got these markets that actually buy and sell the underlying. These are the spot exchanges. Um, so the spot exchanges are a little bit more legitimate because these, this is where people come to buy and sell the, the asset. But even in that, those exchanges, um, people can um, buy, sell, buy, sell, and mess with the volume and um, that stuff you can't really see um, because it's behind the wall of the exchange. They only give you price and volume data. But then there's this other thing, which is once you've bought your coins, you move it onto your self-custody wallet. A decent portion of the of the investors move it into their wallet. Once they've done that, we see everything on the blockchain. So on-chain analysis is really like um, X-ray vision on the investor network who have taken it off the exchange and into their wallets. And we can do crazy stuff. Like we can go, okay, let's just categorize all these people. Who are our long-term investors? And we can tell that by looking at all the addresses and clustering the, the interactions together and go, look, there's, um, you know, whatever, um, 25, 50 million actual users on the network because we can see that with the forensic data science. And then we can go, oh, look, these guys, if we look at their history, um, they only accumulate, they hardly ever sell. These guys are buying and selling and moving coins to the exchange and back again, they're speculative. So you can start to look at that stuff and go, wow, okay, so the long-term investors are really stepping in and buying. Um, and these guys, the speculative guys are like selling out their supply. And you can kind of get that, like this is like a way to view demand and supply as it really is by long-term investors versus speculators. And everything you see on exchanges, you can get like a hint of what's really happening, but you can't see what's happening. So on-chain is like hooking up like sensors and ECGs onto this animal called, you know, Bitcoin, or you could do it with Ethereum a little to lesser degree, but Bitcoin is got the best data um, it's it's very high resolution and really worked out um, and you can go what is the heartbeat the pulse the blood pressure of this animal and you can see everything that's happening and so um, often you get these situations where the traders are like we just had this recently the traders are just screaming bearish they were like selling 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 shorting bitcoin and we had this crazy divergence from what traders were doing following their price and volume metric <laughs> data with all the indicators going, this is horrific. Meanwhile, when you looked at the, the blockchain and the wallet um, data, it was like, my God, the, the entire world is buying Bitcoin and locking up for the long term, eventually these traders are going to run out of coins and there's going to be a complete shock in the system and this price is going to go skyrocketing, which is actually, that, that played out. And so you get this situation where, um, you know, essentially the fundamentals underneath this investment network um, take over. Over the long term, they take over. Under the short term, you get the exchanges sort of moving the price around a little bit. And those, um, you know, another thing is that those two exchanges, one being spot trading the underlying, you've got the derivative guys, which uh, they trade 
um, 10 to 20 times um, more volume. And that changes a lot. Um, those guys actually can influence the price. Um, and so um, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic where you see these two games play out between um, what traders try to do um, and what um, investors are actually doing. So it's actually quite interesting and you need to, to really understand a market, you need a crypto market, you need the on-chain analysis and you need to match that up with the, the derivative side of things, the, what the, the speculators are doing. And with those together, you can um, make fairly reliable um, longer term predictions around the market if you like. It's very random in the short term, but um, there's been no market in history where the fundamentals don't um, prevail in the end. Um, so on-chain is really the way in which um, like, um, analysts in crypto markets can draw a conclusion. Um, in traditional markets like equities, they'll go in and talk to the companies and they'll review their product, um, their balance sheets, their inventory, the, the way they manage their, their company, the outlook for that market. They'll do all that stuff. In crypto, we look on chain and we see what the um, fundamental investors are doing. Well, I was curious about one of your recent macro observations where you said that the bull market could continue into 2022. What are the signs that you saw that indicate that? Uh, yeah, it's... Um, and so one of the ways in which I measured demand and supply, and ultimately a lot of the things I do on chain is grappling with like what is the real demand and supply between investors. Um, like there's a ratio you can run between, it's really simple, I call it supply shock. It's um, how many coins um, can't you get if you want to buy versus the coins that you can get. Um, so, you know, as the amount of coins grow, that um, in the supply that aren't selling, I'm not selling <laughs> um, versus the people that are super speculative and they'll sell it at any price if they think the price is going to go down. So you run that ratio um, and there's many ways you can like go, who's not selling versus selling, right? There's many views into that lens. Um, and one of the lenses that um, Glassnode use, which is the provider of data I, I use, mostly, um, they look at um, who are long-term holders based on um, their coins not moving for five months. So anyone who's held their coins for more than five months, those coins aren't moving. They haven't moved in five months. They're probably not going to move. You're not probably going to be able to buy those coins. Whereas any coin that's been circulating within the shorter time frame, there's a fair chance you can get those coins because they'll be moving between hands, you know. And so you run that ratio and because it's a very long term, it takes 155 days for a coin to age into from short term to long term. Um, it's a very smooth graph and it's very macro it's, and it's very sure, right? It's very like once a coin's reached five months of age, it's, it's unlikely to change its, its behavior in a volatile way. And so when you run the supply shock on that, you'll see um, this, the, 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 like the demand, essentially a supply shock going up to these, these, these peaks. Um, and, um, and those peaks coincide with mass accumulation by these long-term investors. And they also coincide with all the historical bottoms where um, a floor was put on the price by long-term investors because they keep accumulating and um, anyone who's selling, they buy. And it keeps the price at the bottom. And eventually, once it dries out, no one's selling, the selling's um, exhausted, price moves up. And so we um, were in one of these um, accumulations. The last one ended at October last year. Um, we had a decent spell of many months. We were at peak accumulation by these long-term holders. Um, and then the price started to run up and it started running up, running up. And then those long-term holders started to divest and sell their coins out. And that actually has led, um, you know, culminated with the price dropping down to our $30,000 range from the 60 
even 64,000. And then since then, the same pattern's happening, that they're accumulating, but we're not actually at peak accumulation. And it takes, you can gauge the time, you kind of gauge the time in which um, this happens. And I'm like, it looks like it's, we've got another at least a month or two to, to get to fully accumulating based on historically, it takes this amount of time. And then after that, with high probability, you can say, um, well, once they're accumulated, then the price is going to run up because all the coins are taken off the market. And, um, and then it takes months for that to run up, right? And so like you work out the time frames. it's like, man, we're going to blow past this year and we're going to keep running up. And, um, and like every bull market in the history of Bitcoin tends to peter out around the Christmas time of this, the, the year following the halvening, which we had. Um, so the schedule really is for this bull market to peter out around December onwards. And currently the, the on-chain data is saying um, otherwise. And um and again you know like um it's really difficult to mess with the fundamental data like people were wondering what you know what is the top for bitcoin when will it happen and i just said at the start of this year i do not know i can only look for the you know three months ahead yeah. maybe six months if i'm lucky and now that we're in, approaching our fourth quarter the data looks quite different from any other cycle we've seen before um, and people keep thinking that we'll, you know, template this bull bear cycle to past ones. And um, if you look on chain structurally, everything looks different. Um, and actually, every cycle was structurally different as well. So um, yeah, I think um, it's a fair chance that we'll we'll, we'll uh, not go into what we think, which is a, a traditional, you know, Bitcoin bear market, which generally um, is a huge retrace of maybe 80% of its value. And it also takes about um, nine months to a year to shake out. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. And I think now judging from um, the maturity of this market and the impacts of the different parts of the demand and supply from different parts of the ecosystem, um, we're breaking out of this four-year cycle, which was really contingent on, you know, the network being programmed to have um, its um, kind of newly mined coins every four years. Like that drop in the new coins being dumped onto the market yeah. is now quite insignificant. And I think that taking that all into account and what I'm seeing on chain, I, I don't think we're going to have... Um, like what we see these normal four-year cycles um, again. I think um, I'm calling this the last cycle and people think that's very somber and bearish, but um, no, I mean like this thing does a drunk walk of ups and downs trending upwards as it finds its, you know, adoption um, for um, indefinite amounts of time. These four-year cycles are gone. Um, that's what I think might be happening, um, wow. which is, I think it's a big revelation because that's um, against the expectation of what the majority think. Um, so we'll, we'll see if that plays out. Well, so what does that mean for the price? Because I've seen videos where before you were predicting like three to 400,000 per coin by December 2021. I think then you corrected it to 200,000. So now what's your, your prediction? Well, I don't actually make predictions. Everyone says I make, I'm predicting this and that. All I'm doing is reading the, the, the value of a particular model that I have that continually tracks the price um, over its entire um, history. Yeah, and that that model gives you an upper bound of where price can go, and every past um, top of a bull market has hit that upper bound and dropped. Um, so if you assume that we hit, um, you get a top of the market in a cycle, um, you know it, it it went it was like between three hundred and four hundred thousand was the projected. Um, upper band for December and that keeps changing because as we get closer we get more price information and um, now it's like 
I haven't looked recently, but I think it's around 200,000 is where it might be the upper bound. But if you take into the context of this other on-chain data we have, um, it means that we're not going to have a market top, like a traditional cyclic market top where everything goes into a mania phase and everything runs up and then we have a blow off top and we come back down. We have this drunken walk. It's like the S&P 500. Um, it just keeps wandering upwards. Yeah. Um, so it can be in the midline. And um, so the price could be anything between two, two models that I have, um, if they hold. Um, models are models, they sometimes break. Um, so the upper bound is like 200,000 plus, right? And then there's lower bound, which is, you know, I think it's below the current price um, by significant amounts. Wow. Um, but like um, the, the answer to this is that it means that let's not look at the upper bound anymore. Like we're looking at the wrong thing. You one ask that question because at the end of this year is the expectation that's the top of the this bull market and the end of this bullish cycle. If you remove the idea that we're going to have an end of this bull market like all the other cycles and we do this drunken wonder then this model doesn't really matter too much. And the idea of what is our price end of this year doesn't matter too much because um, people basically want to know when are they going to sell their coins um, and go to cash and wait wait out another year till this thing bottoms. Um, and it, it's just interesting. It just means maybe you shouldn't be selling. Um, maybe like we should be like equity investors who just, invest and wait for this thing to keep going up without trying to time this market you know it's obviously worth timing the market if you're going to lose 80 percent of your value over the next year but um you know we've just seen a pullback of um you know 50 percent pullback and then it's recovered over two months like i can i can see a lot of these things happening but that's not a bear market for bitcoin Mm -hmm. you know the bear market of bitcoin is 80 percent and six to 12 months <laughs> so um what do you mean by last cycle i mean that sounds like so doomsday what what does that mean yeah i know it's like it's the last of the four-year cycles um it's the last of the this like if you look at the price chart over the 12 years we've had three prior cycles and every one of those it's done a huge run up it's done a huge pullback um, but retains most of its, its gain from the last cycle. Um, and then it's done it again and again. You know, the last one we went from below 200 or like 150 was the bottom and it went to $20,000. And then it pulled back from $20,000. Imagine investing $20,000 and then like you come back to the end of the year and it's like $3,200. Like that was the last cycle. Um, that was the last, uh, that was the previous cycle. Um, and the ones before that was more carnage. Um, and we waited like a year for that to, to, you know, purge itself. And I'm just saying that kind of experience is likely to um, not happen again if what I'm seeing plays out. Um, and we just, yeah, so if... If we were to look back in like 10, 20 years time and we look at the price chart of Bitcoin, you go, look, there's four, three cycles, whoop, down, whoop, down. And then on the fourth time, it doesn't do that pattern. And it becomes like this drunken wander of price discovery as it finds its fair value as Bitcoin, you know, spreads to a billion people or more, um, which is actually projected to, to do in the next four years. So, yeah, um, I, re I remember your tweet where you said that back in 1997, like you compared Bitcoin to the internet back in 1997, and today it's on track for a billion users, right? So it just goes to show that the adoption is even faster than the internet was. Yeah, it's, um, it's faster than any other network. It's, you know, mobile networks, um, that, that was um, faster than the internet, and Bitcoin's rolling out faster than mobile networks, so... Um, it's got some pretty interesting um, consequences, right? Um, 
like in four years time if a billion people are on this network and this network's growing at the rate of nearly double um, per year um we're gonna see like a fair chunk of the world um using this network um by the end of the decade but in four years a billion people you know so like it's huge consequences like this internet native currency that you know nation states don't like because they like to print their own money um it, it, it's it's like this new force that has risen um and it's a challenger to the monetary standard that we have currently um so like if while well, the current trajectory is saying that there are huge ramifications geopolitically um you know and it's like um like two percent of the world is on this network um people will know it they they've heard of it but maybe only two two and a half percent of the people that's the best data we've got around that of the world have it doesn't look like much um but this is all exponential growth so um like um i think the human genome project oh i, I don't have the figures on hand but it was like maybe 10 years to get to one percent and um the following few years they finished the, the pro project because um the technology and the growth of them sequencing the genome was going exponentially so yeah. um we're at two two and a half percent of the world population um and it's 12 years old and that's not halfway it's in the end game of bitcoin's growth because in four years it's one eighth of the world population the other four years it's like full saturation um got it so, so when you mean last cycle it's almost like you're saying that it won't be as volatile anymore it's gonna as it continues to become a legitimate asset class and more people adopt it you mean like last cycle as in it's not going to have these massive corrections it'll just kind of continue to teeter up and find its fair market value yeah pretty much it's going to be the last um whipsaw okay. um, wave four year wave um yeah it, it's it's a little bit like i think dan held um popularized the term the super cycle yep um, which is we skip a cycle i guess um like there's too much bullet bullish activity that we skip this one and i'm going one step further actually once we skip the cycle if we skip the cycle the fundamental driver of these cycles is so inconsequential in power that um, there's no more cycles that we've seen these big super waves. Um, so it's the this this is the last super wave, and that super wave is the big one that lasts for a decade and keeps going up to you know billions of people using it. Perfect. Um, are there any on-chain indicators that institutions have been coming in and they just haven't announced it yet? Because I know there's so many people wondering when are some of these big companies going to put it on their balance sheet the way MicroStrategy did. Are you seeing any indications of that? Yeah, um, definitely. Um, yeah, someone bought um, a big, I'm just trying to look at my chart. Someone bought a big big uh chunk in that lower thirty thousand dollar range um looked like it looked like um a fair chunk of a billion dollars worth um and then someone else did it again so um there's i think there's a lot of unannounced buys that and certainly um the the rumors uh, rumorville, rumorville amongst um, the people in the know um, some of the journalists that um, i've talked to um, have talked about this um, but no i don't i don't know names um, but i've heard there's been um, you know major companies buying um, i can see it on chain like there was two major buys probably in the the billion dollar class um, one was in um, you know, one was like two months ago when price was about $33,000. Um, and then we had another chunk of buying on like, um, you know, about four weeks ago as price started to really shoot upwards from that bottom. Um, so yeah, there's, there's been some significant buying, certainly. Um, I'm interested to know who that is. I'm, if it's a public company, you, they have to um, divulge that. So. September will be an interesting time when those um, those 
third quarter reports come out. Um, as I start to wrap up here, going back to what we were talking about with the price being so high that it feels like a really big obstacle for a lot of people to get in because it seems really expensive at this point. Um, what would you want to say to everybody? Like if, if you could just share with everyone your message about Bitcoin, what would it be? Okay, so, um, you know, the sticker price is really um, the trap for new people. Um, and actually, a lot of the token projects increase their supply design um, so that it's priced in pennies so people think it's cheap so you can buy. Don't fall for that trap. Um, if you want to look at this um, logically and rationally, what you want to do is you want to um, risk reward, right? As an investor, you're looking at how much reward can I get at maximum for the minimum amount of risk? Um, and so you can calculate that. It's called the Sharpe ratio, which is the ratio of the actual returns you can get divided by the risk, the risk being how volatile those returns are. Um, and you can run that. And it just turns out um, Bitcoin over the long run, um, and, I, and I mean, you can't run this across one month, right? Um, you got to run this over a long period to get a good, good thing on it. Um, Bitcoin is the best. Um, it beats Ethereum. Um, it beats um, any other asset class by a long shot, stocks, real estate, um, emerging currencies. Uh, so and what that means is um, if you've got, um, say you're going to invest 5% um, of your net worth into Bitcoin. Um, if you're going to do it in Dogecoin and you want to do a... Uh, a rational investment, you're not going to put 5% of your net worth in Dogecoin. You're going to put like a tiny little fraction because the risk is so high, but the return's high as well. And um, and so like it, it's it's kind of this thing where like you can get misled. You have to really calculate the risk out. Um, and Bitcoin's, I've never seen anything that beats Bitcoin over the long term in, in that lens as an investor. But if you're a trader, that's a different story. And I think that is what people end up doing. They want to trade. Um, but that is another journey. And if you're going to take that journey, um, don't put too much in uh, because your goal to trade is um, to learn as much as you can for the amount of money you're going to lose because you will lose it. <laughs> you're trading against other people. Um, and if you're new, they're going to have more information than you do. Being in Hong Kong, what can you share about the China mining ban and how that's impacted on-chain metrics? Yeah, that was a big blow to the network um, in the short term. Biggest pullback in hash rate and the security, security power of Bitcoin in its entire 12-year history, and it brought price down with it. Um, but it was like incredibly good for the network in that first, um, the, the network absorbed that fine. The price dropped 50% um, um, in amongst all manner of fear thrown at it, um, announcement by government to ban this. And like you know, China did a number of bans um, as well beyond just the mining. Um, central bankers talking it down. Um, so the price was very resilient. And then um, what we had was a lot of the mining power in um, China um, which was a systemic risk to Bitcoin because like China could have said, look, we're going to confiscate the miners. We're going to take ownership of it and we're going to tell you what to do and 51% attack the network, which they could have done. But instead, they did Bitcoin a favor and said, I want you guys to be out of this country and I want you to be relocated to all the different parts of the world with cheap power and decentralize the network. So now it's resilient from that kind of nation state attack. Um, and so um, fundamentally, it's very strong. It was one of the best things Bitcoin um, could have done to its network. It just hardened up that, that part of its network, which was a criticism. You know, it was like so much of the mining is in China. How can it be decentralized? Um, and when we talk about Bitcoin being a success, um, it really is contingent on um, like decentralization, you know. So the problem with, currencies is because it's it's held by the decision um, committee of a few people running a country um, gold's a bit better 
but that's too centralized because it's held in the vaults of central banks and then they control that and actually we ended up with the current monetary system decoupled from gold because it got too centralized so if we're going to build a new monetary system that is um you know awesome and um fair and equal uh that requires this thing to decentralize and that's the only game in town um so anything that adds to that adds to the hardness of this currency um which china did you know they were like great be de de more decentralized so i was really bullish um over the long term about this network because of it are you a maximalist I'm a maximalist for Bitcoin to win the majority of the monetary network on the Bitcoin network. Um, I'm not a maximalist in terms of um, there's only ever going to be Bitcoin. I'm not a maximalist that if you sell your Bitcoins and you make an investment in some emerging smart contracts network that is working on creating a new technology base for, you know, DeFi apps, um, I don't think that is going to threaten Bitcoin. Like, if I um, sell some of my US dollar, some of my US dollars, and I invested in a Silicon Valley startup, um, people who love US dollars don't um, come and troll me and say, you're weakening the US dollar by selling US dollars and buying the next, <laughs> um, you know, Google. Yeah. Um, and that's the way I look at it. It's like, I'm Maximus on, on Bitcoin. It's going to be um, where I store most of my monetary, um, like crypto wealth is like store it there pack it but i think that there's um, a lot of things to be built um and i think that like as long as you can filter out the scams and i think there's a lot of um there are a lot of things you may call a scam in the space more than other industries but you know i'm used to startups and i know that investment cycle and if i invest in a founder that's working on a new technology and 95% of these startups fail because it's hard to make the next Facebook, right? Um, like, I think it's like 98% before an accelerator, um, accelerator funding, they fail. I don't call that founder a scammer, but um, you can frame that in crypto because of the way the reward dynamics work. And so um, I'm a maximalist, but I'm not, you know? Um, I, I, yeah, I, I, and I think there's more scams in, in, in the Bitcoin world. So there's a validity behind the, the, this kind of toxicity that the maximists throw at anyone yeah. who's not investing in Bitcoin and <laughs> investing in this next thing, which is like um, competing against Bitcoin, which it isn't, you know. So um, I think there's a lot of technology to be built um, on these monetary networks. And um, I don't think it's going to be built on Bitcoin, not all of it, some of it, but um, there's use cases that need new technologies. As far as just on-chain metrics and in terms of like your career, do you feel like you're kind of fulfilling your passion and your calling by pursuing this as your career full-time? Like not a lot of people can say that Bitcoin is their full-time job. Yeah, it's interesting in that I, I kind of thought I'd be out of the game by now and that, like, you know, I, I tend to get bored um, after about four to five years working on stuff and I want to find some new thing that's, newfangled thing that's um, not well understood and, you know, is, is like that glowing um, <laughs> cypherpunk, um, you know, clunky screen where it, it just feels so new and um, it hasn't been the case with Bitcoin. It's been very engaging. I'm still learning lots every day, um, huge developments every day. So um, I am quite surprised that it's turned into a job. Um, <laughs> like, yeah, who would have guessed? <laughs> and I, I think, um, I don't think there's a formula to it too. And I, I look back, I go, um, if you get into a situation where you have the privilege um, to, to have time off, um, you have runway, and to just pursue stuff you really love, I mean, that's just the best, because if you get good at it, um, usually there's something at the end of the, I mean, I, mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't get paid for what I was doing for like um, 
maybe uh, five, six years. Um, wow. Like, other than my, um, my, my crypto holdings, I mean, I mean, that's one of the things that I think um, people in Bitcoin have done is that they've paid themselves because they hold Bitcoin and they do their own research and build useful things for other people. And it's just this, this um, you know, what do you call it? It's like a scholarship paid by Bitcoin. Yeah. Um. <laughs> well, last question. Um, when you look back at your life, I mean, you've had such interesting experiences. You've lived in different countries. You've traveled all over the world. You started your own companies, went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Kind of a weird question, but if you could go back in time, you know, what would you tell your younger self, that young boy growing up in New Zealand? Oh, I would have said, um, I would have said uh, travel um, earlier. Um, do the things you're scared of. Um, and I probably mentor, I'd mentor him on money a bit more. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, like, I think that's the main thing. I think out of all of it, I was like, just get off your butt and do all the things you're scared of. Um, I think that's the, that was the, the key. Um, that was the key rule that I ended up discovering many years later. And I wish I had, had taken up that rule set and had the guts to live that. Um, you know, earlier, I would have saved a lot of years that 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 kind of was wasted. I'm like learning from the, the mistakes help you too, right? But <laughs> yeah, that's it. And tell them to buy more Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, well, if it had been invented back then, <laughs> I would, I, yeah, okay, I would say, you know, in 2009, remember <laughs> to mine some Bitcoins. That's what I would say. <laughs>